Loving Father, Lord, thank you for the consistency of Scripture. Thank you, Father, that it's not a moving target, that it's something that we can know, that we can practice. And Lord, not to just go through a checkbox type lifestyle or religion, but to form those disciplinary habits of walking with Jesus that we might deepen our relationship with him. So Father, guide us today. Send your spirit, please, to speak through me. Lord, give me the words that I need. Hide me behind the cross, yet use me as that conduit of your grace today to bless my brothers and sisters here in Elizabeth City. I thank you, Father, for speaking through me, for sending your spirit to anoint my mind. Please cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And Lord, please bless my brothers and sisters. Help them to receive meat in due season as it were today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So why the image of a stool? Well, you'll notice that this particular stool has how many legs? Work with me. Three. Three legs. And you guys have heard this illustration, I'm sure, right? If you take one of those legs away, what happens? It'll fall over. Now, I had somebody get a little cutesy with me, a little cheeky one time, and they said, well, Pastor, I could balance on two legs. Good for you. But the stool will not stand up by itself without all three. Are you with me, saints? Yes. So I submit to you today that we need all three of these legs of spiritual discipline. And so the first leg that we will talk about is a consistent prayer life. And you'll notice that we have a, a theme passage, right, what we're presenting from. It's Philippians chapter 4, 6 through 9. And I've read this passage many, many times, and it wasn't until a few months ago that I kind of saw all of this coalesce and come together. And I was like, wow, Paul was trying to tell us something that I had not clearly seen before. I had focused on verses 6 and 7, verse 8, but I had not tied it together that this was actually the three legs of spiritual discipline. So let's look at the scriptures together. Now, I'll have it on the screen. If you want to see it in a different translation, this is New King James. You're welcome to look at your Bible. But I'll be teaching from the New King James Version today. Follow with me. We are told to be anxious for how much? What does it mean to be anxious? Does that mean that I've set aside my worry or that I'm sitting around concerned about it, overly concerned? Well, if I'm, if I'm anxious about it, it's got me nervous. Right? I'm sitting there fretting about it. How many of you are natural worriers? I hate to have to rebuke you today. <laughs> but the scripture's bringing it. The scripture's bringing it. And I'm going to tell you, remember Jesus' words? He says, which one of us can add a cubit to our stature by worrying? If you could, my grandma would have been 18 feet tall. My grandmother was a professional worrier. If there were competitions, she would have had one of those big wrestling belts. She worried about everything. I was so thankful as a Christian when I found this passage to be anxious. Don't worry, don't fret over anything. Be anxious for nothing but in a few things. Come on now. But in how many things? Everything. everything what should we do? Prayer. Everything by prayer. The first word that we see come up there. The next word, prayer, so we, we think we know what prayer is, right? Most people, if I asked you, define for me prayer. Most of you could probably tell me. The next word, however, gets some of us a little, uh, I don't really know how to define that, but it says that we should do it by prayer, and then what's the next part? Supplication, Supplication with what? Thanksgiving. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to whom? Pause for a second. What did Jesus tell us in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8? I'll give you a little clue. I'll remind you that Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter 6, you will find the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Do you remember what he said in verse 8 about how much you're going to tell God? If you don't know what Matthew 5, 6, 8 says, I wonder how we'd figure it out. It actually precedes the Lord's Prayer. Open your Bibles. If you don't remember Matthew 6, chapter 8, I want you, excuse me, chapter 6, verse 8, I want you to have this in your head. Because some people look at this and they say, here I am, I'm informing God. Matthew chapter 6, in verse 8, what does it say? For your Father, what? 
Your Father knows what you need before you ask. So let's not forget that all Scripture has to harmonize with itself. Amen? So if we're looking at this and Paul says, make your requests known to God, he's not trying to tell you that you're informing God. He's just reminding you where to make your connection. Okay? It's, it's not, oh, God, well, let me tell you something because you don't know it. God already knows. Then on the other side of that coin, I have people ask me, well, if God already knows, why do I need to bother to pray? Because you're the one that doesn't know. And when I say you're the one, the finger's pointing right at me too. How many times in your life do you think you have it all figured out and you really don't? And I love what we are told in Steps to Christ, that prayer is not about bringing God down to us. It's about bringing us up to God, right? And so we want to remember what the Lord is calling us to do. So let's break this down. We're going to come back to the rest of that verse, but I want us to tap in to these streams of prayer, you might call them. The first one that we see there says, everything by prayer and because they made me learn it in, in Southern and in seminary, I'm going to put the Greek on you as well, okay? I just got to get a little value out of my education. But the first word there is prosuke, all right? And prosuke, prosuke is just that average kind of prayer, right? When we talk and say, Lord, please forgive me of my failings. When we're praying and asking God to strengthen us in something, right? When we're asking him to give us victory over a particular sin, maybe... Praying and asking God to help me like somebody. You ever struggle with that one? Have some folk you just don't like? I've got great news for you today. The Bible has no command for you to like anybody. But I've also got some bad news. You have to love them. You have to love them. Love your neighbor as yourself, right? We are called to love one another. And so maybe if you're struggling to find some love for somebody you don't really love because you don't really like them, maybe you need to pray for them. I was raised with a stepfather that we had a mutual hatred for one another. He came along when I was about three years old, and he liked me a whole lot until he and my mom had a son. And then I felt like I didn't belong. And I grew up with a deep dislike for him and then I became a Christian and it dawned on me I do not have a license to hate anybody if I'm going to profess to be a follower of Jesus Christ and I started praying I said Lord help me to see my stepdad the way that you see him I'll tell you saints if you're sincerely praying that prayer about somebody you don't like God will change your heart and if he doesn't change your heart, it's because you haven't surrendered it. Yes, yes. It doesn't mean you're going to like the same things. It doesn't mean you're going to enjoy the same kind of food or same music. Or I mean, my, my stepdad, we became much closer. And to the point, I even asked him to be the best man in my wedding. But he liked country music. And I don't even know how anybody listens to that. <laughs> but we still got along. Do you get my point, saints? Yes. You don't have to be uniform in your agreement on everything, but God is calling us to love. That would be one of the areas that falls under this prosuke, this regular kind of prayer. But what are we talking about when we're dealing with thanks, or excuse me, supplication? That's the one that gets a little tricky for us because we're like, well, what is supplication? Very simple. Again, show you the root word of that, deesis to express a need to God. Have you ever had people rebuke you for asking God to supply needs? I've heard pastors in sermons before rebuke the congregation, oh, don't just be coming to God with your wish list. Now, let's, let's be fair. Should God be treated like a celestial Santa Claus? Well, that was a very weak no. Some of you got this backwards. I hate to see some of, some of y'all's pictures, not Jesus in Gethsemane. Some of y'all got Jesus' face on Santa Claus somewhere, right? You're scaring me. Jesus, God, is not to be a celestial Santa Claus. He's not a blessing vending machine. But we're being told from Scripture, don't be anxious, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Look at the root word. Supplication is supply. 
There's nothing wrong with asking God to supply our needs. In fact, let's go back to the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our... Is daily bread asking to supply a need? Was Jesus the one that gave us the model prayer? Is it okay to ask God to take care of my needs? Absolutely. But if that's all we focus on, we become imbalanced Christians. And we love our ditches in Adventism. I often meet with churches, as I did with you guys some time ago, when you were in a pastoral transition. I just had another one of those meetings Thursday night. And we talk about what kind of needs we think we want for a pastor. Right? Just had one of these meetings with one of our other church groups. Then we drove over here. But when we think about this, wanting our needs met, sometimes we get a little selfish. Right? It's all about me. And I encourage them. I said, as you're thinking about a new pastor to come to your district, ask yourself, what kind of pastor do we need that can also help us reach our community? Right? Not just the kind of pastor I want, but to meet those needs that we would have in the community. Jesus asking us, pray for our daily bread. Nothing wrong with asking God to provide for our needs, but it has to be balanced. We in Adventism like to fall into our ditches. Mm. Many times people will say, well, we want a conservative pastor. Mm. We've even had some situations where we want a more progressive pastor. Do you remember who the conservatives were in Jesus' day? Pharisees. How many of you want to be a Pharisee? Do you remember who the progressive liberals were in Jesus' day? Sadducees. What I love to tell churches is I don't care about your labels. I want a biblical pastor. And when we interview pastors, I want to know if they're solid biblical Christians who affirm the three angels' messages in the context of the remnant church. I don't want to fall into the ditches, right? And if we say we can't bring our needs to God, who else can supply them? I believe my God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And I'm not too proud to say, Lord, please sell a few head of cattle. Help a brother out. Lord, I can't do this. This is too big for me. But if all I see him as is a celestial Santa Claus, I'm in a ditch right? I'm in one of those ditches of extremism. I'm in one of those ditches of imbalance. And remember this, every mile of road has two miles of ditches. The devil doesn't care which ditch he gets you in. He doesn't care whether you're ultra conservative or progressively liberal. As long as he gets you imbalanced in some format of your Christian experience, I got you. Let's not let the devil get a hold of us. And pray for me that I don't have to get rebaptized over this phone. <laughs> this thing keeps timing out on me. I'm talking too much between slides, apparently. So what's our next piece? Prayer, supplication, thanksgiving. Notice the word there, Eucharistia. You may have heard if you're a Catholic believer, a former Catholic believer, celebrate the Eucharist. Right? Same root word that we're talking about here. Giving of thanks to God. I appreciated that you took time in your prayer, in your, your prayer portion of your service to call for praises. Amen. We don't focus on praising God enough, saints. Yes. I can tell you there's been many times I've led a prayer meeting or another prayer service in a church setting, and you ask people, tell me how God's been blessing you, and crickets. Yes. Saints, I'm going to tell you, God blesses us more than we often care to remember. And Jesus was into praise, again, in the Lord's Prayer. This is Paul writing to the church in Philippi, but it's Jesus teaching. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Does that sound like a praise and recognition of reverence to God? What's the end of the Lord's Prayer? And thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for a moment. Oh, praise God, forever and ever. Amen. Does that sound like a declaration of praise, yes or no? 
So we look at these things and we kind of gloss over it without recognizing that it's one of the streams of prayer. Amen. Yes, I need to pray for my salvation. Yes, I need to pray for God to help me have a heart of love towards those that are unlovable to me. Yes, yes I need to pray and ask God to supply my needs. And, and listen, if I know about your needs, I'm our Pathfinders this morning, trying to raise $75,000. They're 2600 they're, they're, they're about 5%. Right? If I'm doing my math right there, half a percent maybe. That, that's why I went a liberal arts degree. <laughs> they got a little bit of money to raise. There's nothing wrong with praying and saying, God, help supply that need. Amen. Right? But then I need to make sure I'm praising God. Yes. How many times do we ask God to do something? He comes through and we fail to return. We end up being one of the nine lepers. Mm-hmm. Did, didn't I heal ten? Where are the others? I healed 10. And, and, and the nine who didn't return were Jewish believers. He said the only one that's returned is this foreigner. He was making a point to point out that the people who should have known to return and offer thanksgiving are the ones who didn't come. How many times do we in the church who should know better don't do better. I praise God for his mercy. So as we look at this, consistently connecting with God through these three streams of prayer mitigates or diminishes what? Our anxiety, our stress, and our worry. If you're one of those worriers that was willing to raise their hands publicly and admit it a while ago, and some of your closet worriers, you were afraid I'd single you out. Some of you, you're afraid. I don't want to, I'm raising my hand. That preacher's crazy. <laughs> you call on me. Listen, give it to God. Yes. Let prayer be your spiritual fasting. Amen. What happens when we fast from food? We're supposed, when we feel hungry, to pray. When you feel worry, let it be the same thing. Let that worry be a trigger for prayer. Amen. Mitigate that stress because you're turning it over to God. Yes. Notice our next piece here. This anxiety, stress, worry are replaced by God's perfect peace. And his perfect peace guards our hearts in Christ. We'll go back and finish the rest of the passage now, right? If you'll do these things and the peace of God, which what? You can't explain it. But you can tell people I've experienced it. And I can't tell, I've done that. Served with the United States military, was deployed for 12 months to the northernmost city of Mosul in Iraq. And I've had people tell me, ask me, were, were you worried about your safety? And I'm not some superman. I was a chaplain assistant. I wasn't some hard-charging, kicking indoors infantry guy. I was the administrative bodyguard for the chaplain. But you know why I didn't sit around and worry about my safety? Because God had my back. The army gave me body armor. Jesus gave me heart armor. Amen? Yeah, and when when mortars started coming over the fence or small arms fire, I didn't say, hey, go ahead, God's got me. Listen, I'm not stupid. I might be crazy, but I'm not stupid. I believe what Benjamin Franklin said, God helps those who help themselves, amen? And I'm not going to be presumptuous. Okay, it's an act of faith to trust God, but he also wants me to use the brain that he gave me. I'll never forget what my grandpa told me. He said, boy, your head was meant for more than holding up hair. And I remember the first time he told me that. I was like, my head's holding up hair? (laughs) Finally, I figured it out. Use your brain. I'm not just going to stand there and make myself an open target. I got under the hard shelter. I mean, I'd say, Lord, just... Take care of us. Take care of us. And he did. But I love this piece too. It will guard your hearts and minds. Through whom? Christ Jesus. And notice the implication. Here's the implication. And I'm going to go back and pick on my warriors a little bit. When you try to control it, when you're in that worry mode, it opens up your heart and removes that protection. Because when I'm worrying over it, who's maintaining control? Now listen, I'm not saying 
that we shouldn't be prudent. I think there's a, what we could call healthy concern. Right? If I know I've got bills coming up, let me just throw on some YouTube and scroll some Facebook, some Instagram, some TikTok. God will just send me checks. No, the Bible also says if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. Get off yourself and go get to work if you can work. Amen? But if I'm doing my part, God's going to take care of the rest. If I'm doing my faithful part that he's called me to do, that he's called you to do. And friends, I believe that is this first leg of spiritual discipline in the Christian experience. We have to have a consistent prayer life. And it's got to be every day. It's got to be throughout the day. Remembering what Christ has done. Calling on him. I find myself in situations weekly, sometimes daily, where I'm saying, Lord, I don't know what to do here. Help me. And I have to pray when I'm driving. I, I, I don't know if you have to pray when you're driving, but I live in Charlotte. And pastor, folks want me to have to be rebaptized. <laughs> I have to pray not to hate people. <laughs> for their, I'm, 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 I'm just being transparent with you, saints. People's driving in their, 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 their just rudeness and inconsiderate and disrespectful. Putting my life at risk, my wife's life at risk, that irritates me. And sometimes my reactions make my wife pray more. <laughs> so pray for me, saints. I don't get a pass just because I'm a pastor. I have to have a consistent life of prayer too, amen? Yes. But the next part of it, notice leg two, is that consistent study life. We looked at, Ma excuse me, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Now let's check out verse 8. Again, this is not something you haven't heard before. You have heard this. You have read this. Remember, brethren, finally, whatever things are, and I'm going to skip, if you'll permit me, for the sake of time, all the whatever things, okay? Whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, whatever things are of what kind of report? In other words, they have a good reputation. Are you with me? If there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, then what should we do? Meditate on these things. And I don't know how to go back, gentlemen. What do you do when you go too far? Oh, mercy. Never mind. We'll just keep going. The key phrase here is meditate, right? And it means to reckon or to consider. Do you know how happy I was to find the word reckon in a Greek lexicon? You'd say reckon up in Michigan. They look at you a little funny. But I love messing with my Michigan members. I would tell them, Pastor, that I was bi-dialectical. Not, not bilingual, I'm bi-dialectical. I can speak English and Southern. And, and that's a fact, I can. I can say, Yuns, hey, hey listen, Yuns, go get your kids and bring them over to Mama's house. We're going to go over to Mama Nims, and I can speak Southern. You know what Mama Nims is, right? And I love what old Jeff Foxworthy said one time. He said, mayonnaise is both a food and an expression of quantity. Right? I like mayonnaise on a sandwich, but mayonnaise is a lot of people in here right? That's a southern thing that some people just don't get. I like that I can come south and people know, man, man, there's a lot of people in here and they know I'm not talking about buttering up a sandwich, okay? Words have meaning and when it says to reckon something, it means to think about it, right? I'm considering it. And some of the translations don't say meditate. Some say think upon these things. Others say dwell, Right? The whole concept is, is that I'm focusing on it. Yes. It's not something that's off over in my periphery. Right? It's not something that's over here in the background that I'm just kind of halfway paying attention to. Boom. It's front and center. Yes. Saints, I'm here to challenge you. Is the Word of God front and center in your life? Right. Does the Word of God take precedence over your opinions? Yes. Or... Do you surrender your opinions to popular tide? I have a love-hate relationship with social media. Just going to tell you. I love it for the ministry value that it provides me. Being able to connect with people around the world. But I hate 
that we cowardly hide behind it and use the shield of anonymity to tear down people. If you've got something to say to somebody, be man enough, be woman enough, be Christian enough to say what you've got to say. Guess who started gossip? Guess who created gossip? The devil did. It tells us in the Old Testament that he was corrupt by the abundance of his trading. What did he trade in? Malicious gossip, slander. And when you and I participate in malicious gossip and slander, we become a child of the devil, not a child of God. Amen. You got something to say, say it. And the Bible tells us to focus on that which is true, lovely, pure, noble, of good report, that which is virtuous, yeah. meaning that it draws me closer to God. Amen. Okay? Meditate, dwell on those things. Well, pastor, I've got other things to do. I can't just sit and read the Bible all day. I'm not saying that you should, but as a Christian, shouldn't you read it sometime? Yeah. Yeah. I'll be honest with you. I appreciate the technology that we use nowadays, but I don't like scripture verses being put on the screen. It makes us lazy. We don't know where anything is in our Bible anymore. Amen. I'm not trying to put anybody down. I've got it on the screen for you, okay? <laughs> but I'm just telling you, when I'm regularly preaching and not using PowerPoint, I don't want verses on the screen. Look it up for yourself. Yes. Remember where things are in your Bible. Yes. We used to, as Seventh-day Adventists, be known as people of the book. Amen. It's high time, saints, we get back to being the people of the book. Know what the Bible says. Believe it for yourself. Don't just take my word for it, your pastor's word, your elders for it. Look in the word for yourself. If we don't know it for ourselves, you don't really know it at all. You don't know it at all. Where's my sister that went to Jamaica? She, may, she might be. Are you familiar with Scotch bonnet pepper sauce? Come on now, she's, look, she stood up, she's ready to testify. <laughs> so the reason I bring that up, we were visiting with one of our pastoral families, they invited us home for lunch afterwards, a few other folks, and I'm a brother of what likes a little hot sauce. And so they, they said, Pastor, you like hot sauce? I said, well, well yes, ma'am, I do. And she said, well, you got to try Jamaica's Finest. And she brings out this bottle, and it said, Scotch Bonnet. I was like, okay now. And I put some of that on, and I'm going to tell you what, I got two bottles sitting in my fridge. <laughs> but before I tasted it, it was just somebody else's testimony. Mm. Are you with me? Amen. But, when Amen. I, but when I opened it up, mm. oh, mercy. Well, listen, if, if, you, if you eat something called a hot sauce and it doesn't leave you just mildly diaphoretic across, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's, that's what I want. I, I don't want it to where I'm just a mess, but I want where I got to, oh yeah. <laughs> I want to feel a little bit. Saints, I believe the word of God has to be the same. Yes. If all I hear is you talk about it, it's still in, it's yes. still in the bottle. Yes. I've got to open it for myself. And I believe this, this, this consistent life of study that God is calling us to have is exactly that same kind of thing. This verse is the Christian's call to a consistent life of Bible study. And it's noteworthy that this follows the admonition to have a life of prayer. You might figure out some things in the Bible without prayer, but most things you have to have prayer to give you spiritual discernment. There's a lot of people who study the Bible for no intent on being changed by the Spirit. I read an article literally just this last week that the Chinese government has assembled a team to rewrite the Christian Bible. Did you see that? Anybody else see that article? One example of something that they want to change is the story of Jesus standing between the woman caught in adultery and those who were going to stone her. And when he starts writing, they disappear and he says, woman, where are your accusers? There's nobody here. Well, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Chinese government has rewritten that section because Jesus doing that is an act of public defiance and makes him a dissident. 
they have rewritten it to where Jesus is the first one to pick up the stone and throw it. Huh? Doesn't surprise me. Doesn't surprise me at all. Absolutely. Saints, my point is, and to my sister's point here, with, with the recent and now deep integration of AI in so many things, You've got to know what you believe. Amen. Yes. And you've got to have trustworthy sources. Yes. You can't trust a picture anymore just because it shows somebody doing something. Amen. You just don't know. Amen. But we know that the Bible is true. Yes. When we have God's irreplaceable peace, our minds are more open then to meditate or dwell on the word of God. What do you say? Amen. You get some of these distractions out of the way and you say, Lord, help me understand this. Mm. And here's what I love. I can read the same passage multiple times, come back five years later, and I see something different. You cannot exhaust the Word of God. It's too deep. It's too profound. Imagine the blessings that await us when we embrace this practice in our walk with Christ. And I'll just put this back up there to highlight. And I want to ask you a question as it relates to the words highlighted in the light pink. Are there things in your life that aren't true? Are there things that you're dwelling upon and filling your heart and mind with that are not noble, that are not pure, that are not lovely? You follow what I'm saying? Are there things in your life that you've incorporated into your daily practices that are anything but praiseworthy? But yet, that's what we might meditate on. Can we, can we challenge ourselves today to surrender those things that don't match up with Scripture, let's just lay them at God's feet today. I I am a firm believer the only thing God wants to take out of my life and your life are the things that keep me from being fit for heaven. Is that fair? He only wants to take out of my life the things that defile my character and keep me from being Christ-like. And so if I've raised my hand and say, I want to be a Christian, yet I cling to that which keeps me from being Christ-like, what am I doing? Who am I fooling? Only me. Meditate on these things. The third leg, a life of action. We'll just go to verse 9. The things which you learned and received and saw in who? In me. Who's the me? Nope. Who wrote the book of Philippians? Paul. So Paul, as the author of this book, is saying to mimic whose behavior? His behavior. And we, immediately, just by the responses, we want to go to Jesus. Question, if Jesus is living in me and through me, and my life and my actions are lining up with Scripture and Jesus' teaching, is it okay for you to also emulate me? Yes. Now, if I start going down crazy town, jump off the train. Don't let somebody follow somebody to perdition, (laughs) okay? But Paul is simply saying, listen, I've tried to live a godly life before you. And if you adopt some of these practices, they are going to be a blessing to you, okay? But it goes a little deeper. You received, you heard. I love that. I wish I could take a lot of time to unpack that. How many times in your life have you heard something but you didn't receive it? We don't like to receive things that make us be challenged. And I found out a long time ago, I used to think, Pastor, here here was a discovery that I made. The Lord gave me. I shouldn't say I made it. The Lord gave it to me. When I was a relatively new pastor, I used to think, man, the saints hate change. But I found out that's not true. How many of you are still, that have been out of high school more than 10 years, are still wearing the same clothes you wore to high school? Ladies, how many of you are carrying the same purse you even carried last year? (laughs) One. My point is, we don't dislike change. We dislike loss. And when we think we're losing something, that's when we get riled up. And what we as Christian believers have to figure out how to do is as we grow as a church family and as we make necessary changes for that growth, we have to do it in such a way that we mitigate the loss. 
And when I made that discovery, it transformed my ministry. Because I thought I had these great ideas and the saints were just stuck in their ways and crazy. And I realized we were both crazy. I didn't know how to present it and they didn't know how to hear it. God had to get both our hearts right. And notice we have to receive and hear. Do what? These do. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. Saints, what this is, is a call to action. If you click on an ad or you read some sort of ad on social media or online, there's a call to action. If you receive a piece of junk mail trying to sell you new life insurance or something, there's a phone number, right? There's a call to action. That's exactly what we're looking at here. These do. This is a call to action. And of course, the word there just means that, to do or practice. And I should tell you, just like when he said pray, it's an imperative. This also is an imperative word. In other words, it's a command. Yes. He's saying this is what you have to do. You want to be successful as a Christian, yes. you have to have action. I don't know how many of you have read the church manual, but there's not a single reference to chair warmer. <laughs> I've never had a nominating committee where we had to select chair warmers. God hasn't called us to just sit there and be observers in the Christian experience. He's called us to be active participants. Yes. Every one of us in the body of Christ. Amen. This is a call to action. What good is prayer and understanding that does not move us to action? And think about one of the primary things that Paul did. He didn't just model how to live the Sabbath. Most of the time he was converting Jews. Did they know how to live the Sabbath? Mm. Kind of. They at least knew what day it was. Can we get that far? They had it all messed up and had so many prohibitions added to it that they had it messed up, but they knew about the Sabbath. The primary thing that he modeled for them was reaching the community. Amen. Paul was not from Philippi. He was known as Saul of Tarsus. He came to Philippi as a missionary. Just like my brother said, he went to Palawan over in the Philippines. Am I saying it correctly, Palawan? He was there as a missionary. One of the things Paul is calling the church in Philippi to do is not necessarily go and be a foreign missionary, but to be sharing the gospel with the community around them. Amen. There's a call to action inherently built in, and God has no interest in merely giving us academic information. Yes, the Bible says my, my people perish for a lack of knowledge, but it needs to be knowledge that spurs us to action. Next part, he wants each of us to answer this call to action and tell others about the love, mercy, and grace of God. Answering this call to action is the key to keeping God's irreplaceable peace fixed in our hearts. Notice, when we respond, the things you saw, the things you heard, the things you received, do this, yes. and the God of peace will be with you. Yes. Notice the implication if I'm given truth and I reject truth, can God be with me and as, as, as I reject his truth? No. no. <laughs> Friends, again, it's not a secret formula. It's the same formula that God has called us to. A consistent life of prayer. A consistent study life. And a consistent life of action. I submit to you that these are the three legs of spiritual discipline. And by God's grace... I want to have each one of those legs actively working in my life. How about you today? Amen. Can I pray with you? Loving Father, what a blessing and a privilege it is to have your word, to know your will for our lives. And Father, this is not new information. I'm not bringing something new today, but maybe somebody was reminded of what they should be doing. Father, you know where each one of us is on our journey. You know whether we've been faithful or just playing the game. You know whether we've been open to your teaching or just the things that we liked. You know if there's things that need to change in our life. Father, please send your spirit to keep us faithful. Put a desire in our hearts to want to pray to you. And yes, Lord, I know it's, it's difficult because we don't 
hear an audible voice answering back, and maybe we feel a little crazy just talking what it feels like to ourself. So Lord, help us to sense your presence when we pray, to know that you are with us. Send your spirit to anoint our thoughts. And Father, help us to pray in our work, when we're driving, whatever we're doing. Put an atmosphere of prayer around us. May we know what we believe. Help us to set aside the social media and the streaming platforms and get into the word. Show us what it means to be people of the book again. And Father, call us to action. Give us opportunities to share our faith. Give us divine appointments that we wouldn't have unless you open those doors for us. And may we walk through them and share what Jesus has been doing for us. Father, I pray that your spirit would be upon each one here today as we accept this challenge. Thank you for hearing our prayer, I ask in Christ's name.